from that 2018 UMBC team that won as a 16 seed. Presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Welcome back to another episode of 68 Shining Moments here on the Field of 68 Media Network. I'm pleased to be joined today by UMBC head coach uh, Ryan Odom and former point guard KJ Mora. What's going on, guys? Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, before uh, before we actually get into the, the buildup to the game and the game itself, right off the bat, I have to ask everybody that's involved in these shows, um, what does it feel like knowing that you have become – uh, synonymous with, with March Madness and Cinderella's and, and what you guys were able to accomplish uh, back in 2018 is going to be something that we talk about for the until the NCAA stops playing college basketball It's going to be something that is always brought up like what is it has that really sunk in that you did something that's going to resonate for that long coach why don't you start yeah I mean I, I tell you what it's it it never gets old uh, you know talking about uh, you know that particular year the year that I was able to spend with the, these great guys, one right here in front of you, you know, and KJ, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, um, you know, my friends will remind me of it at times, you know, coaching peers, you know, uh, obviously, you know, people around here obviously are, are really still really fired up about it. Um, but it's just unique. It's hard to describe um, because when you're the, when your team, our university is the first to ever do something in college basketball. I mean, that's just it's some heavy weight with that, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, not something that I think about every every single day, but it's just you know, it is a pretty cool thing. Yeah, college basketball has been around for so long at this point to be the first to finally do something, KJ. That's that's pretty impressive. It's pretty memorable. That's pretty big. Um, and I think the most important uh, part of that game is that we gave we gave hope to the small schools, small mm-hmm. programs that get to the tournament already thinking, are we playing against Duke? We're playing against Kentucky. They go to the game basically to have fun and and not thinking about winning a game. And I think now those teams, though, middle and low major schools are coming to the game with a mentality like, we're not underdogs no more. We belong to this tournament, and we're going to go try to win a game. Well, speaking of which, I I want some honesty here now. You're you're not just playing a number one seed in this matchup, right? It's not just Virginia. You're playing a team that went 31-2. and that won the ACC regular season title, that won the ACC tournament title. Uh, did you, and maybe coach, this is the best for you because I'm sure KJ would have a different answer. He seems like a pretty confident guy. Did you really think that you could go into this game and win by 20? Was that something that you really believe was possible? Be honest. I'll, I'll take you. I, I learned pretty early on with this group that I was fortunate enough to coach to never doubt them, right? to try to try to give them more confidence. And that was kind of my role as the coach was to just, you know, roll with it a little bit, obviously keep things in check, but, um, you know, with that particular game, we all had a had a collective gulp or gasp or whatever once, once that Sunday announcement hit where, oh, you're playing Virginia. And we knew what that meant. Uh, like we weren't, uh, you know, stuck in some little cave where we didn't know what Virginia basketball was all about, especially in that particular year. Uh, uh, they have one of the best coaches in college basketball, if not the best. Uh, their team that particular year was the most well-balanced team on offense and defense. Uh, they were they were in the top five on both categories. And so we knew we were in for an uphill fight, you know, going into it. Uh, had you asked any of us prior to that game, are you going to win by 20? Absolutely. Uh, we would not have said yes. Um, but I would not have said, you know, this team's not capable of competing uh, and, and being in the game. Uh, I think that was that was certainly in all of our minds. We felt like, you know, we could compete, you know, with anyone, you know, at that point. We had played earlier in the season against a very good Arizona team who had, you know, the number one pick in DeAndre Ayton. And, you know, we were in that game. It was 58 to 55, you know, in the second half. We played an excellent SMU team who was coming off of, you know, a 30-win season the year prior. We were up 13 with, you know, not a lot of time to go. And in both of those games, KJ didn't play. Um, and, and so we felt like we could compete, uh, but you never know until that ball's tipped up and you start playing. So, KJ, let me ask you this. When did you, when did you feel that moment that, that you can kind of say, okay, we're, we're, we got a real chance. Like, we're, we're going to get this done. You know, when like, like during the game or before the game? But like, during the game, when was that moment was like, okay, like, we're in this. We, we, we got a shot at this. Oh, we can, we can pull this one off. I think, like, since the beginning, we knew we had a chance. But um, when we meet at halftime and the game is, like, 21-20 or really low score, 
Um, and we come out the second half, and Joe Sherburn goes like on a 7 0 run by himself. Then um, I started thinking, like, okay, like we better, we better start making a lead and a run. But once uh, Jarris made like a, a left hand floor after a foul call or something like that, I, I, we can't lose. Like, this guy is not going to miss, you know? That basket but, didn't count. <laughs> yeah, it didn't count. It didn't count. But after he made that basket, I knew uh, something special was going to happen because that, that guy could have missed that day. Well, uh, can you, I just, were you aware of, of what you were doing while it was happening? Like, did, did it register to us like, wow, we are, we're running the, the second best team in the country off of the floor in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Like I'm always fascinated by, by people that are, are doing these incredible things in the moment. Like how much of that were you aware of, or were you just kind of, were you going just playing kind of in the moment, living it? To be honest, it didn't hit me like until we was like walking down the ball, like at the end of the game, and we're looking at coach, we're looking at the fans. That's when it really hit me that we did something really big. But during the game, like you're just so focused on the game plan and what you gotta do against your team, uh, against your rivals, that um you're not thinking uh, on that specifically part of the game. You're thinking more of like this is what we gotta do, and you gotta keep doing it until the until it's zero on the on the clock. So. That's what we did. And once we saw the, the crowd and I look at coach and we said, I told you, we started hugging. That's when they really felt like we did something amazing. So, uh, coach, I'm curious, like when, when you were going through it in some of the huddles that you had at the end of the game, um, how much were you kind of like talking yourself into this idea? Like, OK, you know, everyone I think everyone watching the game was kind of waiting for Virginia to, to wake up and, and make that run and get a little bit of confidence. So how much were you like, OK, if we could just get, you know, get this possession here, get to eight minutes and still be up by 10, get to four minutes and still be up by 12. Like how what was what was going through your mind while all of this was happening? Yeah, I mean, I think just coaching the game, you know, trying to make sure that my guys were calm and collected and and, you know, ready to finish the game. Um, you know, for us, there was a stretch where there was it was a long stretch of basketball where there were no fouls and it was kind of back and forth. Uh, there were no timeouts. There was no dead balls. And, you know, I can remember Jairus was cramping at one point and had to come out of the game uh, for a minute. And then he would go back in, he went back in, but obviously we got to a, the lead was, was, you know, uh, so great at that point that we, I was a little bit nervous in that our guys would continue to shoot it quickly um, and then get a little bit or, and also potentially get a little bit tentative. And so within those timeouts, my, my biggest thing to them was, hey, they're coming after you. They're going to shoot it faster. They're going to start playing differently. They're going to start pressuring you. They're going to start going for it, reaching more. We've got to make sure that we're really good with the ball. But when it's there, you need to take it and, and play forward, I think is what I was saying, you know, basically down the stretch. Like, don't, don't sit there and hold it back when they're going after you. And then all of a sudden, we cough the ball up as opposed to take, take the easy ones when they're there. And I think, you know, having a veteran uh, core group of guards that I was fortunate enough to coach and KJ and Jarris and Jordan, you know, I felt pretty comfortable because they had been in games like that uh, before where they had had big leads and just needed to finish it out. So I, I want to know for both of you, what is your, what's like the, the defining memory that you have from that game? Like what's, what's the one thing that you think about the most? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Um, I think I would say, uh, uh, it's hard to pick one, but it's just seeing my dad at the stands with the, with the big head and having that faith that we was about to win a game. Uh, it was a couple times that I looked to the fans and I saw him like so euphoric and so into the game that I think that's, that was my favorite part of the game, looking at, at the fans, like enjoying and really believing we was going to win a game that it was almost impossible for us to win could you could you feel like the crowd kind of turn um for you and, and start rooting for you is that because you always hear about how all the neutrals start rooting for the underdog in these um, right they'll say turn <laughs> did you feel that was that happening in the arena actually like our fans was kind of shy at the beginning because you know we we was expect to lose or something but once they saw we was staying in the game and building a lead the whole Coliseum was just rooting for us. And it was like a home game for us and an away game for Virginia, especially all those ACC rivals that they want to see them lose. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they was cheering for us. So it, it, it was a big boost for us too. We'll get back to that interview in a minute. But first, let me tell you about our partners over at DraftKings Sportsbook. With March Madness beating down our door, DraftKings is the best way for you to get a little action in on the game. If you have not downloaded the DraftKings Sportsbook app yet, well, what are you waiting for? 
It's the safest, it's the most secure, it's the most reliable, and it allows you to deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. And this week, they are offering Field of 68 listeners a pretty sweet deal. If you sign up now with the promo code FIELD68, you can turn $1 into $100 if one of the main event fighters in UFC 159 this weekend lands a single punch. That's it. One punch to turn $1 into $100. And don't worry, if MMA is not really your thing, DraftKings Sportsbook offers odds and promos on basketball, on hockey, on really whatever sport you're watching. They got it. They got odds. They got specials. They got whatever you want. But since they're basically giving away $100, you might as well sign up now. Watch a little UFC and remember to use the promo code FIELD68. That's FIELD68. You must be 21 years or older. Offer available for a limited time only. Eligibility restrictions apply. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Coach, what's the defining memory of that game for you? Yeah, it was at the end, you know, just watching these guys smile. I think I said that after the game, you know, watching these guys experience that, you know, euphoric uh, moment and just they had worked so hard, you know, and, and I think back to, you know, a guy like Jordan Grant, Jairus Lyles, you know, guys that had been there, Joe Sherburn, you know, prior to our staff coming in and they'd had some hard years, you know, and, you know, then all of a sudden KJ comes in, you know, with our staff and several other guys as well that, you know, were important to our team. And to see how hard they worked from the very beginning when we first got here to that moment uh, was, you know, extremely uh, gratifying, you know, for me just to watch them celebrate on the court and in the locker room and just be so happy. Um, so there wasn't one moment necessarily during the game or anything like that. Um you know, obviously, you know, we were kind of all getting hit after the game, you know, from a lot of different sides of things from a media perspective. But, you know, I grew up in a coaching family, so that wasn't something that wasn't normal, you know, for me. My father, you know, had a lot of success as a college coach. So I, I'd kind of been around that side of it. But to see my guys, you know, so happy, you know, that that meant everything to me. So take me through those those moments in the locker room, right? It, it's always – it's hard for me to wrap my head around, right? Because you pull off this unbelievable upset, like we mentioned, something that people are going to be talking about for a hundred years and you still have to turn around and go play another game in like 48 hours. Right. So like, how long does the celebration last? At what point are you like, guys, listen, we, we got to move on. We got Kansas state coming up. Like this, this, this isn't the end of the season. We got to keep going. Like how hard was that KJ for you to kind of wrap your head around? Like, it's not, we're not done yet. We got to keep going. I mean, it was a little difficult, especially because the media doesn't make it easy on you. you you're just going to keep seeing it on ESPN. You're going to keep getting interviewed about it. Instead of talking about Kansas State, that, that's what it was what, uh, the next game we had. So I think uh, the hardest part is to, like, switch the game plan and focus on the, on the scouting report that the staff is going to give you, especially when you got all those type of emotions in your head and, and everything. But um, we had a mature team. We had a, a really good group that it wasn't that hard. Like, at the Kansas State game, we was there to win it, too. We was uh, two minutes left. It was right there, uh, two-point game, three-point game, a couple of possessions, and we could have won that game. We just didn't make no shots. But uh, as part of, like, moving forward to the next game, I think the guys did a great job, and they was pretty much sure about it. Yeah, because it wasn't like you got ran off the floor the next game either. I mean, yeah, you should have we, played we, that fought, next game. we fought hard and had a, a big chance to win it. I, I, I still feel bad about that game. More yeah. than winning about winning the Virginia game was fine, but that Kansas State game hurts the most because I felt we had a good chance. And if we win that game, who knows what might have happened, you know? Yeah, no question. I think right after the Virginia game, I, I think I wrote on the board zero and 135, you know, and then I marked out the zero and then I put one <laughs> and I said, you guys are the one. And then below that, I wrote zero and zero. And I said, wouldn't it be a shame if we were still talking about this up here and we didn't take take advantage of the first 16 to ever play in a second round game and put our best foot forward? And so I, I wrestled with it a little bit. Um, you know, do I when we get back to the hotel, take their phones? Do I you know, what do I do? And, uh, you know, I had different guys talking to me about it, assistant coaches saying what you know, what their their thoughts were. But we all settled on it would have been unnatural for me to do that because that's not how I am. I, I generally let my guys be and uh, I'm not 
making them stay off of social media or any of that. I just want them to be responsible and respect the opportunity that they had. And they did that. I have no regrets about, you know, the preparation that we had going into that Kansas state game, Kansas state beat us fair and square, but it wasn't because we didn't, we were, we were still thinking about, you know, the Virginia game. Um, we certainly had more circumstances surrounding it, more distractions surrounding it. Uh, but our guys played their hearts out, uh, you know, in that Kansas state game. And I am like KJ, I still think about that one. Coaches always think about the one they lost. <laughs> I think, more, I think more about that one than the Virginia game, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the last question I got for you guys is this. Um, it's my personal opinion that that you deserve a ring from Virginia for the 2019 title, because I don't think that they win that title if it's not for you guys, because you I think you kind of forced Tony to switch what he runs offensively. Like in 2018, it was all blocker mover stuff. They always had those two bigs out there in 2019. You watch them. They would run a lot of ball screen stuff, a lot of ball screen continuity. Uh, and in the national title game, like the way that they closed that game was with Braxton key at the five and Deandre Hunter at the four. And I don't know if he fully buys into the idea of playing small, if it's not for you guys. So what do you think? Do you deserve credit for that national title? Should I give it to you? Am I right there? No, nah, no, nah, we would never take, you know, better than that. We would never take credit for something that's not ours, but you know, I think, I think the, the lesson there and Tony said it, you know, is, is, you know, when you go through it, adversity, you know, those, those opportunities have, have a way of, of giving you a gift that you never could have gotten on your own. And I think that certainly is what happened there. Um, you know, it, it, it is no secret that they went out and went and got a little, uh, a little point guard in key a Clark that was very similar to this guy right here. <laughs> all right. Who uh, you know, was, was a great player. Um, as well. So they saw it up close, but um, yeah, I mean, I, nobody was happier than us, you know, for Virginia. You know, I mean, I grew up there, obviously my father was an assistant there. I was a ball boy for the team. I mean, I, I lived on that campus and in that, in that arena. And, you know, one of my best friends in coaching is one of Tony's assistants, Orlando Vandross. He and I work together. I know Jason Williford extremely well. Tony and I are, are friends. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, that was a, the only bittersweet part about us winning, you know, that, that game was them having to endure that loss. But uh, the redemption was, was tremendous, you know, to see Virginia win it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the best story, uh, and maybe in in the history of sports, you have the the 16 seed upsetting the one seed, who kind of has this reputation for losing in the tournament and so whatever, like that that stuff's kind of overblown. But um, then they come out the next season and they have like the miracle run, like you had the the Mamadi Diakite shot, you had Kyle Guy hitting the free throws in the final four, you had the DeAndre Hunter, like so the the you whole Gardner Webb start right, yeah, the Gardner Webb start, like the, the whole run, of, yeah just everything right. about that story is just uh, it's if you wrote it into a movie i'd say that i don't believe it. that's that <laughs> never happened in real life. Right. there's no question and uh, there's no question about it and i think what it speaks to is you know certainly tony's leadership you know within his program and his kids but i also think it speaks to our kids too you know and mm -hmm. i think what kj said right at the beginning is it not only gives hope to you know uh, you know other division one teams or low major teams, whatever you want to call them that enter the tournament, it gives hope to little kids out there. Like KJ gives hope to guys that, you know, are his size that dream about playing college basketball. All right. And playing on that big stage, any kid that, that laces it up in high school or AAU or whatever, they dream about playing in that sign that's right behind KJ's head, March madness. And, you know, for us to be a small part of that, um, you know, is really rewarding for sure. Where where'd the big head come from, KJ? Is that from the the actual game itself? No, uh, my dad uh, was in Puerto Rico before the conference tournament. Um, so he came to the conference tournament with the big heads already from Puerto Rico. So he came through the airport with him and everything. <laughs> and once we uh, won the conference tournament at Vermont, what which he was there too, um, he decided to go to Charlotte too. So he brought the big heads to Charlotte. And, uh, I would love yeah. to know what the uh, the people at the airport were thinking when they saw this guy walking through with a big head. If somebody with a <laughs> the flowing air and a head at the beginning, they said, "Oh, this guy is crazy." But after we won, everybody was taking pictures with him. <laughs> <laughs> the quick uh, funny story. So KJ father, he has a shirt that said K on the front. It says KJ Playmaker. All right, and on the back it says Why Not Us. And so you know you have the shoot arounds the day before the game. 
we're there at the shoot around and, you know, kind of the, at the end of the shoot around, we had the final four crew, you, Jim Nance, Bill Raftery, Grant, uh, Hill. Grant Hill. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it, it was, it was pretty cool. And so I walk over there to talk to Nance and he says, Hey, I do these games every year, 16, uh, and 16 is never beaten in one. You think you can get it done for me? Like he puts me right on the spot and I'm like, I'm <laughs> what are you kidding me? And, uh, and so I just happened to look up in the stands and I see KJ's dad holding that head right there. And on the front of his shirt, it says KJ playmaker. And I said, Hey, uh, Mr. Mar, I said, turn around. And it said on the back, why not us? <laughs> True story. <laughs> That's awesome. True story. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, listen guys, I appreciate the time. Uh, thank you so so much for coming here and hanging out with us, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again soon. Awesome, thanks. Thank Rob. you, thank you for having us, man. Love you, KJ. Be good, love buddy. You, love you too, Coach. Thanks, guys. That was awesome, KJ. I love I love the big I love the background. I love the whole. <laughs> background. Everything is it's hey, awesome. I, I had to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now you better awesome. pull us through tomorrow. Now, I'll be watching that game, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll be watching. I'll be you watching. Text Nate if you got any ideas in the middle of the game. I'm screwing yeah. up. I'll give you this kind of report. <laughs> All right. All, All right, right. Thanks, guys. Thanks.